Hello, I'm Peter Borgen, librarian at the Hamlin Midway Library in St. Paul, Minnesota. This is our 27th year of hosting the Fireside Reading Series, and we are thrilled to be able to carry on the tradition even in this unusual year. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Fireside Reading Series from our Fireside. If you were here, we would love to offer you cookies and coffee or tea, and we'd all squeeze into our children's area for the evening and listen to great writers read from their books and talk with them about their work. Obviously, this year is different. And we are happy that you have chosen to join us in this new format to carry on our long tradition. Tonight, we are happy to feature Cal Kalia Yang with her book, Somewhere in the Unknown World, a Collective Refugee Memoir. The St. Paul Public Libraries have copies of our featured author's works available for contactless hold pickup at the Hamlin Midway Library or via Library Express at other library locations. You can find all the details at our website, www.sppl.org. I hope you're cozy wherever you are and that you enjoy tonight's event. Thank you for spending time with us. Uh, thanks, Peter, for, for setting the scene. I'm Wendy Worden, the Programs and Services Assistant for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, and I'm happy to be here with all of you tonight. As we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people as fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and Ojibwe peoples are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. On to our main event. Fireside is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We're so grateful for your support and your presence this evening. We will begin, of course, with a reading from Kaukalia Yang, and then open things up to questions from you. And we will follow up the program with a brief survey to get your feedback, so do be on the lookout for that. And we have partnered with Next Chapter Bookseller in St. Paul, and they have created a page with our featured books, so do check them out if you are feeling so inclined to pick up any books that you hear about in the next six weeks. Um, as Peter said, we're pleased to kick off tonight the first in our, in our series for 2021 with Kao Kalia Yang. She is an award-winning Hmong American writer. She is the author of the memoirs, The Late Homecomer, The Song Poet, and Somewhere in the Unknown World. She has written children's books, A Map into the World, The Shared Room, and The Most Beautiful Thing, and co-edited the essay collection, What God is Honored Here, Writings on Miscarriage and Infant Loss by and for Indigenous Women and Women of Color. Yang's literary nonfiction work has been recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Chautauqua Prize, the Penn USA Literary Awards, the Dayton's Literary Peace Prize, and garnered three Minnesota Book Awards. She is most beloved. Yang is a recipient of the McKnight Fellowship in Prose, the International Institute of Minnesota's, Minnesota's Olga Zoltai Award for her community leadership and service to new Americans, and the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts 2019 Sally Award for Social Impact. Welcome to you, Kalia. I cannot wait to hear you read this evening. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that lovely and long introduction. <laughs> it was. I and, apologize. Uh, it's enough of me. <laughs> lovely. And thank you all of you for joining us. It is a pleasure to kick off the Fireside Reading Series. I think after the day that we've had, it is only appropriate that we start out with the reading of a poem. Um, one of my favorite poems, The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. Now like the brazen giant of Greek fame, 
with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air bridge harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pump, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I begin with this poem because when I was a child, far away from being a writer, in my loneliest moments as an American, sometimes invisible in the country that I was calling home, I would go to this poem and I would feel like somewhere in the history of this place, there was a welcome for me and for others like me. And so today, I'm a Lazarus, the new Colossus. But I'm here tonight to talk about Somewhere in the Unknown World, my November 10th release, a pandemic book. These pandemic books, and last year I released three, have entered into a very quiet world. But I believed each and every step of the way, that once this quiet is done, there will be so much work and that this book will be a part of the work that needs doing in this place we call home. I will begin with a reading from the book. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children whose fates have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. And I would do something I've yet to do yet with this book. I'm gonna read from the very back of it. I'm gonna read a part from my story. In many ways, this is the night that the book begins. It's 2016, a storm is raging through the Twin Cities. And um, that's the last thing I wrote, but it's the first thing, the beginning of this book for my children. It stormed through the night, our house shook with the force of the wind. I woke up afraid for the three of you, asleep in your room on the other side of the wall. I got up and walked on creaking floorboards to our bedroom door. In a flash of lightning, I watched your father sleep, an arm raised over his head, neck turned far to the side, a hand on his chest. In the hallway, the door to your room kept ajar, swung on quiet hinges. The display of lightning outside the hallway window flickered like the start of a movie. You three slept in your usual line, horizontal on the bed, each on your own pillow, legs and arms tangling with one another's. Yu Peng was at the foot of the bed, close to its edge. He hugged the body pillow that we gone during my first pregnancy, now with you three, but with baby jewels the little brother who died inside the 19 weeks. Taiyang was in the middle, turned toward Xingyang, an arm flung across her chest. Xingyang was at the head of the bed, turned toward the smooth aged wood. I stood by your bed in the dark, listening to the rhythms of your breathing, holding my own. In the hallway again, I paused at the window. The string of lights your father hung in the backyard behind the garage, between the slate patio that separates the foliage of our yard from our neighbors, shown in the dark. A swaying series of orbs, miniature planets blazing in a line. In their glow, I saw the two metal chairs that your father and I had sat on, on our wedding day. The aged ribbons tie to their backs flying in the fierce wind. Eight years ago, your father and I brought the circles of our lives together for a moment to celebrate our union. The most popular question of the day was, how did you two meet? There was the easy answer. I had just published my first book, The Late Homecomer. I had been invited to give a keynote at Oxford University and your father had been advised by his faculty mentors to come and see me. 
a young Hmong American author. The moment of our meeting is captured on a DVD your father purchased after my talk. I'm standing at the front of the chapel on a stage. Ahead of me, coming up the aisle between the pews of the church are lines of people, your father among them. Once the people are seated, the camera pans across the crowd and we see the figure of your father slouching in his plaid shirt, rolled to the elbows, a notebook and a pen in his hands. He's frowning, looking at the stage with furrowed brow. The camera focuses on me. I'm standing as tall as my four feet, 10 inches will allow, in a white button up shirt tucked into black pants, long hair pulled back in a loose braid. Halfway through my talk, the camera pans up over the crowd again, and this time your father is sitting straight, smiling, eyes sparkling. Your father met me that day, but I didn't meet him until weeks later when, we, when he wrote to tell me that what I had said was what he needed to hear and asked if I would meet with him for coffee. I didn't drink coffee, so we met up for lunch. This was the answer we both gave to the most popular question of the day. The answer neither of us was prepared to give that day is the reason why I am writing these words to you, my children. How did your father and I meet? Your father and I met because in the late 1950s, long before either of us were born, America entered a war in Southeast Asia in Laos, a country you know as the birthplace of the Thai and Yuzi. During the war, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States recruited Hmong people to fight and to die on America's behalf. The Hmong were farmers from the high mountains, trained to tend to the earth. We could not win the fight against the communist soldiers. When Laos fell to communist rule, the Americans left the war with the highest ranking Hmong military families. They abandoned hundreds of thousands of surviving Hmong to an incoming government that saw them as enemies. My family was one of the families left behind to face genocide. To escape death, your the Thai and Yuzi fled across the Mekong River into the refugee camps of Thailand. I was born in Bai Vinai refugee camp. I was born with no memories of the war, but stories of how we came to be in this place we couldn't leave, waiting for food to come to us in huge trucks. Your father and I met because when the Americans left behind what would be called the Indochina Wars, they left millions of refugees in its aftermath. In South Vietnam alone, there were six million refugees, all fleeing persecution. Although most Americans did not know who the Hmong were or that the Americans had been involved in a war in Laos at all, President Gerald Ford signed into law the Indochina Migration and Refugee Act of 1975. This act allowed for the resettlement of refugees from South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In 1987, my family was able to register as refugees of America's secret war in Laos through the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and applied for resettlement to America. I was six years old, your father was eight at the time, living a life in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with his mother and father, their friends and neighbors. Neither of us could have imagined that our futures would be shared. Your father and I met because against tremendous odds, some Hmong people survived that war. Against incredible odds, some of us resettled to America. I, a refugee child, became a Hmong American girl who became a writer to tell the story of a wondrous old woman. That writer was invited to give a talk at a conference. Your father, a young scholar, had been in that room and he heard me and wanted to hear more from me. Because your father and I met you three are possible, Xing Ying first, with her eyes the color of seagrass. I held her little feet tight in my hand and felt the beat of her heart and my understanding of strength and fragility shifted forever. Taiying and Yu Peng came together next, one possibility dividing into two. Two little boys with matching eyes and noses and mouths, two little ones who came into the world with big voices, although their bodies were small. Their cries were like sirens across the lands 
the quiet landscape of my being, and I ran from one to the other, pushed beyond the limits of what I believed my body could deliver. Before your father and I met, all three of you were unimaginable. My children, you have inherited a world full of war, a world that has always been full of war. You are the children of a refugee. Do not forget this fact. The people in this book are people from your lives. Fong is an uncle of mine. Sia is a receptionist at the hospital where you were all born. Ian goes to college, to the college we pass every day when I drop you off at school on the edge of the highway, perch over downtown St. Paul. Call's son and daughter go to school with you. Abel works at the college perch on the other side of the city, overlooking downtown. Afghanizada is a Lyft driver who stops for coffee at the cafe blocks from your school. Tommy is my dear friend. Chu is thy thigh. Myra mm -hmm. went to the college I would have gone to if I'd stayed in the Twin Cities. Mr. Michael's daughter went to the college I ended up attending away from the cities. Sigmuda's picture book rests on your bedroom shelves. Every time we go to Big Daddy's barbecue, we pass by High and Khan's restaurant. Irene sings her songs across these cities. The people in this book are people going through the storm with us all on this very night. When I was a teenager reeling beneath the weight of my life and responsibilities, yearning to know the insides of a movie theater, exhausted from imagining what it was like, I told your Yudzi that I didn't want the life I had been granted. I wanted something better. I wanted something more. Your Yudzi told me, life would teach you the strength of the human heart not of its weakness or fragility. His words have stayed with me and fortified my heart in many different moments of hardship. I hope that the stories in this book would do that for you and children everywhere, teach you the incredible strength of the human heart. The storm that night did not cease, the lightning continued to flash and the sounds of thunder echoed. Later, I dreamed that the creaking house we lived in was the house of our forever. I saw you three, your father and me, in the backyard, gathered around those wedding chairs, beneath the string of sparkling lights. Even in the dream, I knew the houses were not meant to last. When the paint of the metal chairs has chipped away and the ribbons at, our, at their backs have been torn into shreds by the storms of life, Remember the somewhere in the unknown world, even without knowing who you would be. I was living for the day you would become. And even when I'm gone, I will look toward the edge of the horizon for your coming. Kao Kalia Yang. That is from Somewhere in the Unknown World. A book that I started writing in 2016 when Donald J. Trump had been elected president. I had a feeling that refugees would no, longer, would no longer be welcomed by the new administration. I lived in a world where my children were continually looking for heroes, where sometimes I myself searched across the silver screens, the pages of literature. But I had an inkling because of the circumstances of my own life, the fact that I had been born a stateless child in a refugee camp, because here I am on the other side of the world, doing the thing that my mom and dad, that my people had thought was impossible, writing stories about men and women who the history books have never known about, who the newspapers often forget. And so I sought to write a book about refugees, a collective memoir about the men and women from around the world from wars of the last 50 years who are now gathered here in the Twin Cities to call this place home. Minnesota is not high for diversity, but we have more refugees per capita in the state than any other state in the nation. In a country when we talk about refugee policy, when we talk about immigration 
In other forms of legislation, we tend to focus on the East and the West Coast. I wrote this book as a Midwestern writer, as a Minnesotan author, knowing that the conversation needed to include us here too. It took me four years for this book to come into the world. First, I was gathering the stories and then I was letting them sink deep into me because I knew that I would not be offering a mirror for these stories, that I, what I was offering was not a, re a reflection, but that I was creating portraits of each man and woman, of each individual who believed that I would do justice to their stories. And so on November 10th, at the end of the Donald J. Trump administration, near its end, the book finally found its place in the world. And I'm so thankful that that place is here and now, at this moment of our history, at this time in our country's history. As a new American, as a refugee child and writer, as somebody who believes in the work that we will do together when the sun rises again in the morning, I'm so very excited to share from somewhere in the unknown world. At this time, because I see that we have quite a few attendees, I'm gonna invite a Wendy to come back and we'll have a Q&A and I'll let your questions dictate the trajectory of our time together. I come from a people, we believe firmly that what we have to give are our words and our tears, that this is a gift from one human being to the other. And so now I invite your words. Thank you so much. Thank you. I absolutely appreciate everything that you've done with this book. And it was, it, as, as it always is with, with your work, it was a pleasure to read it. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you bring your work and your words and your passions about those things to our state. Thank you, and Wendy. We have from, oh, this looks like, from, I despair of my technical ability. I apologize, everyone. <laughs> uh, Christina asks, uh, how did you decide which of the stories to include? Because you do, you, you do begin the book by saying that a lot of, of people um, approached you after other readings to, to share their lives with you and, and where did you, how did you go about collecting the voices for this book? That is a wonderful question. You know, for me, in the beginning, when The Late Homecomer came out, I was 27 years old. I would do these readings and oftentimes um, there would be refugees in the crowd and usually they waited near the ends of the lines and then they would come up and some asked if I would ever be interested in writing their stories too. But I was a young writer. I was still learning how to carry my emotions, to carry the emotions of my community. And I was hesitant about my ability to, my hold over craft, the craft of writing. I was also deeply concerned about issues of representation, appropriation. As a writer from a marginalized community, I know the importance of representation. But by 2016, it's felt to me that the only reason I was not writing this book was because I was afraid. I was afraid of not doing it justice. I was afraid of getting it wrong. And so I allowed my faith, this understanding that the refugee situation around the world was an urgent one. By remembering the words that my father had said to me so long ago when I was just a child. When I believed that the dreams that my mom and dad had for me were too big and that I was too small. When I believed that perhaps I would be the biggest failure, the biggest failure of their lives. I remember being in middle school and pressing record on a cassette player that my father had by his bed and telling my mom and dad these things. I remember how neither of them said any words to me and how I promptly forgot about this recording. And many, many months later, my father came back 
He swept my hair back, the mong gesture of love. And he said to me, you're enough. You have to be enough. You are our biggest and our best chance going forward. You've always been and you will always be. Understanding that whatever fears I had, that I had to be enough. And so that's when I decided that I would go in search of these stories. I knew from the get-go that I would only ask for 14 or 15 of them because every single person that talked to me, I made a promise to myself I would write their stories down. You know, I've seen too often reporters and writers come into, our, into different communities, ask for the stories, and then for an angle to shift or a better case study to be found for those very same writers and reporters to turn away to do nothing with the stories that they've been given. I do not want to do that. I did not want to become like that. And so I promised myself 14 to 15 stories, 14 to 15 individuals, and I would write each and every single one of them down. And that's exactly what I did. I went to this different <clears throat> segments of my life. I went to my community, call and my children. They go to the same school. I met him, in fact, at a school event. You know, Sia's story, I said, Sia is a receptionist at my ch children's pediatrician's office. These are the people in my life. They are the people in my community. And these are the stories that I've written down from the individuals who chose freely and voluntarily to share their stories with me in the hopes that the story, the collective memoir that we would deliver would be a message, would be a call for peace. And perhaps what Mr. Michael said, an understanding that peace is possible, even in the life of a refugee, if we hold on not only to the bad stories, but to the good ones too. So all along the way, I knew that whoever I spoke with, whoever spoke with me, that they would offer me the good stories from their lives, as well as the bad, and that it would be my job as a writer to write them down. And so I did not have to choose in the end. Every single person who spoke with me, I wrote their stories down. I limited, limited myself to the 14. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable undertaking. I, I am, I'm glad, again, again, I'm just so glad for it and, and, would not have wanted it in the hands of any any other <laughs> any other writer. Uh, a question to you from from Sarah, who works uh, with university students uh, who have a refugee background. What advice do you have for welcoming and assisting new Americans in a way that empowers and promotes self reliance? You know. This isn't, this isn't my response, but it is Hara's response. Hara's story is in here in the value of peace. Hara says, judge me, judge me after you know my story. And I think that is so true. So often as refugees, when we enter into a country, we're seen as a drain on the resources here. We're seen as outsiders. We are reminders of war, of the travesties and tragedies of a bigger world. And when, when we're seen and already in such lights, it's very hard for individuals, for refugees, to begin to see ourselves as part of the fabric of this place, as a continuation of the stories of this place. And so I think, judge, yes, you're welcome to judge, but judge after you've learned our stories. I think Hora's advice um, is the one that I would give to. But more than anything, you know, my father reminds me all the time, if the earth that I live under can fall on me, if the land that I walk on can throw me off, who am I to stand in your way? I think in America, sometimes we forget that we too come from refugees. We forget that we too can become refugees. The collection ends with Tommy Sar's story. Tommy is Cambodian American. His parents have survived Pol Pot. They are refugees of war. Tommy was born here, but he was born with muscular dystrophy. Most people who meet him for the first time, including me, I thought 
the time he was in the wheelchair because of what happened in Cambodia. But in Tommy's story, born in Minnesota, he's offered a chance to go on a vacation. Tommy has never been on a vacation anywhere. It's too complicated to take the wheelchair and all the medicine. It's too complicated, not knowing what is waiting on the other end. But when Tommy is just a child, when he's just eight, he's offered a chance to go on a vacation. Of course, Tommy is excited, so he goes immediately. He says, yes, yes, yes. He will get on this van with his aunt and uncle and grandma, and they will travel to California. In California, they take Tommy to Mexico. Mexico for fun, because he's never been outside of the country. On the way back, the adults realize that they don't have a passport for Tommy. And so Tommy's afraid. What if they leave him behind? But they don't. His aunt has an idea. They're going to cover Tommy with a blanket, put him with the luggage, and they're going to just try to come back, try to fool the American government. And to Tommy's relief, they make it across that border. But one morning, Tommy wakes up in this house in California, and he sees that the van from Minnesota is gone. Tommy positions himself by the window. And he waits for them to come back for him so that they can return home. Two weeks pass, and Tommy sees a big moving truck. And Tommy sees his bed from Minnesota and his wheelchair. And Tommy sees everything from his Minnesota bedroom. It is a reminder that in America, we can create refugees, and we often do. You know, the issue of refugees is a complicated one, and it is one that we sometimes understand as something that happens outside of our shores. But we forget that right here in America, we create our own refugees all the time. And so I think it's a, this book, as much as anything, is a humble reminder that we all can become refugees, that no refugee ever knew that they were going to be one. Even, even me, born a stateless child in the refugee camps of Thailand. I had no idea I was a refugee until it was time to leave, until the camp was closing, until we had to go somewhere. And so I think understanding all of that and using that to feel not only your intentions, but your actions will channel the kind of thoughtfulness that we all need in order to receive each other. America is not an old country as we've all been reminded of recently. Before we were here, there were people, Native Americans. We became Americans because we became Americans together. We are Americans because we are Americans together. We are an American that is continually coming home to each other. Thank you for your question. And like I say to my students, if I don't answer your questions, please ask from a different angle. So I have another opportunity to think about the thing that matters to you. You are so generous with, with, your, with your responses. And it's one of the things that, that I appreciate about listening to you speak. And I love this, this idea of us continuing to become together like that's it's really really meaningful and I want to sort of carry that into all of the work that that is that is coming in in the in the years to sort of rebuild a, a sense of ourselves after we've been so torn down by the last four years I guess um, and and then and to do it better to to do it right maybe <laughs> i'm so idealistic i don't know <laughs> um uh, joan asks which refugee story surprised you the most and and why did it surprise you oh that is such a good question every single of these stories i think as a writer i never want to be predictable I'm always looking to be surprised. But one of the, um, one of the stories in here, Afghanzada's story, I think so beautifully and articulately, articulately captured the essence of, of the refugee. 
and I just want to I just want to read a little bit from it. So Afghan Zara is from Afghanistan. Um, at the age of 19, he graduates from the university. He is brilliant. USAID are looking for workers, and so he volunteers. He he works for them to help his people. A year in, he gets a phone call one day. It's from the Taliban. The Taliban says, "You're wearing you're wearing white. Your mother is wearing black. Who do I shoot first? These calls, the calls continue to come and they get more and more aggressive. They know where every member of his family is. And so Afghanzada goes to his supervisor and he tells them, he tells her what is going on. He looks for a way out of the country. The process itself would take three years to apply for the, for the appropriate visas. There's no guarantee. Afghanzada knows that he, do, he does not have three years. And so his family collect $25,000 US to get a human trafficker to send him out of the country. He ends up of all places in Sweden at a five-star resort that has turned itself into a refugee camp for people from around the world. And here he has a conversation with um, the camp psychologist. And I think this, this conversation, this piece is called Certificate of Humanity, is at the core of the work of this book. But it was for me, I, a writer, particularly of nonfiction like me, you, you don't know how to dream of a story and articulation like this until you encounter it in the world. So he's in Skirbo Hargard and it's springtime. The birds sang their songs, refugees walked in groups of two or three on the green lawn. I was talking to a group of Eritreans helping explain some, com com some concept about life in Sweden when one of the staff walked over to me and handed me two envelopes. The first and the bigger envelope was from the US Embassy. Inside there was that long destroyed Afghan passport made new again, its blue cover firm and stiff, and then a letter granting, granting me residency in the US. The second letter was from the Swedish immigration court granting me Swedish residency. I started crying. We all did. All of us refugees so hungry for some hope of a place to make a home. My fellow refugees from around the world decided they would have a big party for me with cake. We jumped, we danced, we hugged. The big question was, which tree to choose? So this is the, and that's the ending of his story, but this is the heart of his story. The camp psychologist got to know me well. At first, she was unsure about my mental health. She was baffled by my request for a certificate of humanity. She asked me if I believed I was human. I said, of course, but other people weren't so sure. So I needed help proving my humanity. She then offered to provide me with such proof. But why, I asked her, what is the difference between you and me? How come you are more human than me in a position to observe and certify my humanity? After all, do we, do we not have the same blood, the same makeup, the same dreams even? Why are you more successful in your humanity than I am in mine? I told her that if she was going to give me a certificate of humanity, she would have to show me hers first. I had to know who had given her the authority to determine human certification. I had been a human in my country, a human in a war. I told the psychologist that the war was a war on terrorism but I was not a terrorist. I told her about the warlords, the communists, the religious thinkers, and the powerful humanitarians all doing battle in my country. I told her that I was just a human being and that many of the human beings in my country hate war. We were victims of war to be specific of the Americans and the Russians and their allies and their battle for power over people. She listened to me and took notes. Finally, she said, you're not sick. She was then the first in a long time to say, thank you. Please come back to talk to me so that I can learn from you. I would not have returned to her office if it was only for her to learn from me. I was also learning from myself. I was in so much pain and my pain was so focused that I was unable to learn from myself. It took her taking the notes during our meetings and then reciting them to me for me to know what I was saying, thinking and feeling. My dependence on the psychologist got me thinking about Sweden in a more general way. I came to understand that if I stayed in the country, 
I will be dependent on the government for a long time. It took eight to 10 years to get citizenship, assuming that my appeal for asylum was accepted. I started thinking about being independent again, being the maker of my destiny, the maker of my life. I began thinking about America. This, this was a surprise to me. The Afghan Zara spent all of those years looking for his certificate of humanity. I couldn't have come up with that. In all of my thoughts, in all of my wonderings, it took Afghan Zara and his quest. And it was such a beautiful quest, in many ways like Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, that it became my quest as well in the writing of this book. And that is just one of the many stories in the book. Surprising because of its articulateness, but all of the stories, I think, showed me something new, not only about what it means to be a refugee or a storyteller or an American, but a citizen of a bigger world. Absolutely, that one hit me too, and it was just, a, it was such a, um, the, the, the concept of looking for a certificate of humanity was simple and profound at the same time, and I, I was, I was really struck by it. Um, and in, in kind of this vein of really sort of deeply uh, listening to, to one another and, you know, not seeking stories, uh, you know, from a, as you were saying earlier, from a reporting angle or, or case study sort of angle. Um, I think this was from Gail saying, you know, how can we prepare ourselves to be more welcoming of, of these stories from others? in our communities, okay, I like that, that idea of really listening to one another. Do you have wisdom about that? So I didn't talk for many years. I grew up mostly as a selective mute um, in the English language. In all of my years of not talking, I learned how to turn up the volume of my listening and sometimes how to turn it off entirely. I learned that we could control these things one of, I think, the most important things about asking people for their stories is that we have to be willing to listen all the way through without interfering, without trying to make it better, without trying to change the course of the story. You know, when Mr. Michael from Eritrea talked to me about the camera inside his heart, all of the pictures that, that had been taken in his head and in his heart, pictures that he couldn't develop into the world, we both understood that what I would do as a writer was try to develop some of these images into being with my words. But they were images of students, of st young students with places to go and ideas to share, all killed on the streets of Eritrea, of his beloved Asmara, with piano strings, with other things. And I knew that no matter how hard it was to listen, that it was harder for him to talk about them, to, to put them into words. We did this, we had this conversation in a Starbucks, not too far from his house, a Starbucks full of students, a lot of university students. And Mr. Michael and I wept. We wept for the stories and the images in his head and in his heart, the ones that he, were, he was developing word by word for me. And I understood the responsibility of bearing witness, of hearing it, and then carrying it forward. I think that is the hardest thing to do when, when you want to help. But my grandma reminded me often when she was alive that every time we have the power to help someone, we must be aware that we have the ability to hurt them. And I use that to guide me in my own listening, in choosing the projects that I do, in the ways in which I do it, in the ways in which it enters into the world. And these, I think, are just some of the thoughts. If you have the power to help, know also that you have the ability to hurt. Sitting over here nodding like anybody can see me anyway. <laughs> um, I, I really, this is a, 
maybe it's maybe it's too personal, but I like this question, so I'm going to I'm going to ask it from Nancy, who thanks you first for writing the book and that she enjoyed reading it very much. Um, what helped you believe that you were enough to to carry these these stories forward in this way? I love the question. I don't think it's too personal. It gives me opportunity to think about some of the things that matter most profoundly to me. So for every Hmong person in America, two others died so we could be here. I don't know if you all know, but Laos is the most heavily bombed nation in the world. For every citizen, a thousand pounds of ordinances were dropped into the country. My mom and dad grew up in the most heavily bombed province of Laos, Xin Kuang. For every Kao Kalia Yang, two others died so I could be here. Sometimes, and I think it all began when I got, when I was interviewed for the Soros Fellowship, the fellowship that paid for my graduate school into becoming a writer. You know, when I was asked, when I was asked if it was true that wars sometimes bring on good things, and that, was it true that the secret war in Laos, that it brought me to America, and that in America I was dreaming of a life as a writer, and that if not for this war, wouldn't I just be? Another Hmong woman on the high mountains of Laos with a garden hoe in my hand and a baby on my back. And I remember shouting from the heart, the heart of me, saying that I would not, I didn't want their money if I was going to sit at that table and be an example that wars bring out good things. Saying what I knew to be true. Who's to say that the two others who died so I could be here, that one of them couldn't have been a better writer? Or that better yet, that the three of us together couldn't have envisioned a better path into literature. I think about that often when I do the work that I do. I'm 40 years old. I still get intimidated sometimes, but then I think about it this way. There are at least a thousand ancestors behind me. I was their fondest hope and I was their dream. If I am in fact a living dream, don't I wanna be the stuff of which dreams are made? To live fearlessly, fearlessly, to live honestly, to live with integrity guiding me, to live with kindness in my heart and a willingness, a willingness to give love to a world that needs it. When I think about these things, I'm not afraid anymore. When I think about these things, I know that I live in the same world that created Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks. I live in the same world that created all of the people in the history books, even if they don't sound like me, even if they don't look like me, even if someone like me has never been there before. Maybe that space is waiting. Maybe that space is ready. And so then I feel I'm enough. I feel that I have to be enough because how much longer do I want to wait for someone to come along? How many more decades, how many more centuries before a Hmong woman raises her voice to say that our stories matter, that they matter to a bigger world, that the stories that the world has yet to learn of, that these stories have, have as much to do with the making of a world than the ones we all hear about on the radio, read in the newspapers, study in the history books. I know I'm enough. And I know that every single one of us, that we are enough to be the dreams of our ancestors. That's the only way life is possible. It's the only way we can believe in progress. It is the only way I can look into the eyes of my daughter and the eyes of my boys when they ask me if the future is still a beautiful place. I'm I'm going to stand up and 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 clap for the entire audience and I because I, I have to be the stand-in. I mean, it's the the love is is happening in the chat, but I 
and you get me, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I, I don't know that there's any, that's a fantastic place to, to wrap our, our evening. I, it, is, it is powerful and it is truth and, and I, wanna car- I wanna carry it with me. Um, but I would like to, to give the, the audience uh, my, my gratitude for, for, being, for being with us this evening and, and Kalia again for your incredible generosity of spirit and the way you, the way you use words to, to raise up humanity uh, of, of all of us. It's, I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad to be spending this time with you this evening. It's enriching and I'm grateful for you. Thank you, Wendy. I'm grateful for you too. And to all of our public libraries, to the friends of the St. Paul Library, but to all of you who after a long four years, a tumultuous beginning to the year after today, that you found the energy, the love, the heart of our community, that the inspiration to come and join us tonight, join me tonight in conversation. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And I hope that when this is all over, we can meet in person and I can occupy all of my glorious four feet 10 inches, and we can be in conversation in person. Thank you all. I am excited and full of joy to be going to bed tonight as an American. And I look forward to the rise of the morning sun so we can continue to do the good work of loving each other. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful night, everyone. Buy books where, you know, from Kalia's website, from Next Chapter Bookseller, pick them up from your library. We will be back at this time next week uh, with Lynn Anger. And I hope that some of you will join us then. And I miss you, Hamlin Midway Library. I want us all to be there in the future very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>